game. They did it. They did it. They did it. And they're going crazy. They're jumping on each other. One of the most unbelievable finishes you will ever see. And welcome to it. Thanks for being with us here on Orioles Magic, the podcast presented by Miller Lite, Brett Hollander and Jeff Arnold. And Jeff, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing great, Brett. Uh, for those that are, are watching the, the feed of this, I actually have got a uh, brand new Orioles polo that I'm wearing. I got a couple in the mail yesterday. Really excited to, to have some, some new O's gear. And you've got a, a little bit of an older school polo that you're rocking uh, on your end today. Yeah, so we both have... Orioles polos on. I mean, it is Orioles Magic, the podcast after all. If you're just listening to this, you have no idea what we're talking about. But today's guest, Jeff, is number 75, Alan Mills, an interesting guy on a few levels. Uh, he became entrenched in Orioles bullpen really in the Camden Yards era for about a decade, 12 year big league career, a hard thrower, intimidating guy, always used that cap low, known for his mustache, and he just looked the part of a nasty late inning. Uh, reliever came over in a Yankees trade a uh, former first round pick uh, for a couple of clubs actually and uh, just an interesting guy but he's kind of come back to the scene in recent years as an Orioles minor league pitching coach then he became the Orioles uh, bullpen coach in recent years and now he's the manager of the Gulf Coast Orioles and they had a big year last year didn't they Jeff they had the best record in the entire GCL and it was by a landslide they had a winning percentage of over 700 he managed a lot of Orioles of the future including one Adley Rutschman who we touched on at the very end of this podcast and Millsy the very end was talking about how the different influences that he had when he was playing helped influence him when he decided to start managing and I thought he hit upon a really big theme at the end which is that you have to remember to enjoy it and have fun because so many of us, I think in so many fields and, and I, I mean, we're pretty fortunate to do what we do. You only think about getting there and, and you're, you, you can, it's easy to not be able to take a look around and realize that you're in the major leagues. And, and that's what he, he talked about. And I thought was a really good point is like, you've worked your entire career to get here. This is the stuff that you dreamed about when you were a kid. So at some point when you're in the major leagues and I mean, I would probably, you know, I'll, I'll do it every day. Um, look at where you are, enjoy it for what it is because as a player, it doesn't last forever. Yeah. I think it's a great point. So we talk about that, some life lessons from Alan Mills, Adley Rutschman, uh, kind of converting from a pitching coach to now a field manager. Uh, interesting stories about that. Knowing Buck Showalter many decades ago, also, baseball etiquette, the many brawls he was involved with, his thoughts about those early uh, Camden Yards playoff teams, including uh, Jeffrey Mayer at Yankee Stadium. We get into all of that with some depth, and it starts right now here on Orioles Magic, the podcast. And joining us right now on Orioles Magic, the podcast presented by Miller Lite is former Orioles, someone who spent nine years in Baltimore, Part of a 12-year big league career. Number 75, Alan Mills is with us right now. And, Alan, it's great to see you. Thanks for being with us. No problem. Thanks for having me. Let's start with those first two playoff teams in, in Camden Yards history. And you were a big part of those teams in the bullpen. Uh, tell me about your recollection uh, of that 1996 team. The team is below 500 at the trade deadline. So you start August. And to even contend at that point, you guys got to get red hot. And then you guys do. And then you face the defending pennant winners, the Cleveland Indians, who won like 99 games that year. Uh, tell us about yeah. that team and getting to that point against Cleveland and playing the first playoff game at Camden Yards. Um, well, you know, you, you, I got to go back to the point when um, they had to tread that deadline. Um, you know, up until that point, we had kind of underachieved. And – you know, back then you didn't have his, the social media like you have now. And I remember just reading in the paper where, you know, they're going to trade the team away. So basically most of us had our bags packed. You know, I was, from what I was reading in the paper, I was supposed to be traded to Seattle. So I kind of had my bags packed and we got to the stadium that day and nobody got traded. So it was kind of, it was kind of weird because we were all kind of, I don't want to say looking forward to, we're just kind of expecting 
to go elsewhere. And then we didn't. And, you know, I don't, I don't know what turned that team around. It was almost like we started playing fantasy football and kind of like our mind just kind of got away from, I guess, all the things that weren't going well. And we just started having fun, man. And next thing you know, we, we got hot, really hot. What was the role that, that Davey Johnson had on that team and, and keeping you guys in the right mindset after the, the trade deadline and, and eventually helping you guys get back to the playoffs for the first time in a while? Um, you know, I love Davey. Uh, Davey, Davey for me, was um, one of the better managers I'd ever played for. Uh, he, was, he was really good at um, – working a bullpen and, you know, he just kind of, kind of stayed out of the way more than anything from what the position players say, you know, he didn't really do much as far as, you know, telling them to hit and run, bun or whatever. He just let them play. And, you know, that team, we had enormous amount of talent, you know, and it was just a matter of time before we started playing well. And we just got hot at the right time. We had Eddie Murray on recently and we had Chris Hoyles on recently too. And mm-hmm. they, they both kind of look at that trade deadline point. You know, one, it's kind, of a, it's kind of a sense that, okay, we're supposed to do this because none of us got moved. And then the idea of Eddie coming in and even alluded to a conversation that he had with Davey Johnson where Davey kind of pushed him to be that clubhouse guy. Uh, mm-hmm. Any recollection of that? Well, you know, pitchers and position players, we kind of – we reside in different areas, you know, like <laughs> – <laughs> It's, it's completely different. You know, we deal with our pitching coach. You know, they deal with the manager a little more than we do. I mean, when I see a manager, he's either handing me the ball or he's taking the ball out of my hand. You know, usually, other than that, I really don't have much to do with him. So, you know, when Eddie came along, Eddie's he's a, he's a born leader. I mean, anytime you hit 500 home runs and, you know, have as many hits as he does and, you know, be the player that he is, you're going to be a leader, you know, and, you know, like for Cal, Cal, same way. Cal's more lead by example, you know. I mean, he was a leader in the clubhouse as well. But, you know, just having someone else of that caliber can only help a team. What was it like watching Mike Mucina pitch that year, uh, almost winning 20 games? Ah, man, not just that year, any any year, man. Um, Mike was was a joy to watch. Um he, he was a special individual. He really, really was a smart guy and really good pitcher. I mean, there, there was nothing. I was talking to somebody the other day about him, and there was nothing like watching him pitch a game. And the next thing you know, he's retired like 15 straight guys. And it seemed like in the blink of an eye, you're in the last part of the game. It's like, what happened? Like, he was just he, – he was good, masterful. That's why he's in the Hall of Fame. I mean, he was great, great teammate and great to watch him pitch. All those years. It's funny. I just heard Mike on another podcast, the uh, Buster Only one at ESPN. And somehow you came up. I actually forget the, the context of it exactly. But some of the effect of Mike saying Alan Mills was the funniest, easiest going individual until it was time for him to come in and pitch. And then the light switch. And you were known. You know, I almost can't. I almost don't recognize you that your goatee and your hat below your eyes. I mean, that's how you were viewed on the mound. <laughs> right, right. Um... You know, a lot of people think I'm I'm some mean guy or crazy guy or guy that likes to fight, but I, I'm actually just the opposite. I'm I'm usually having a really good time, but um, you know, once once the game starts and you come out of the bullpen, it's pretty intense. I mean, the job I had for a number of years, you know, if I come in a game and I give up a hit or two, the game changes. You know, so you know it's a it's a time to joke around and there's a time to be serious. And, um, you know, I kind of took my job serious. I kind of like what I did. When you come into the game, how would you manage your adrenaline? Because obviously you want to have it, but at the same time, and I'm, I'm sure you might've talked to young pitchers about this when you were a pitching coach, you don't want it to get the best of you either. No, nah, it's, a, it's a fine line. It's almost like, um, you know, I live in Florida and, you know, we, we, we deal with a lot of hurricanes here. And, you know, it's almost like a, a calm before the storm. You know, when a hurricane comes, you may have a light drizzle, wind may be blowing, and it's like, it's coming. You know, you just know it's coming. Same thing warming up. You know, you 
your intensity, your anxiety, all of that stuff is is high, and you kind of have an idea of who you're going to face and what you got to deal with, and it, you know situation coming into the game, and you're going to be amped up, you're going to be ramped up, you're going to be you're going to be fired up. You come to the game, the crowd's going crazy. You know, if it's on the road or at home, it's it's a little different. You know, on the road, it becomes really loud because you give up a hit, it's going to get louder. You know, um, what you try to do is just kind of harness it and kind of bottle it and channel it in the right direction because it can get away from you really fast where, where you can lose control of the situation. And next thing you know, you're in the shower, like, what happened? You know, so you you kind of you kind of learn how to channel it over time. You know, when you're younger, it's a lot harder. But as you get used to it, you kind of learn how to how to direct it. In your time as a big league uh, bullpen coach, and your time now in the minor leagues, can you see guys who are wired that way to be relievers? I mean, to to walk that tightrope late in games with the crowd into it, and knowing you're going to get the uh, the opponent's best effort late in the game uh, with everything on the line. Yeah, you you can see it in some guys. Um, you know, when I first came to big leagues, I was kind of caught in between a starter and a reliever. You know, I had done both in the minor leagues. Um, me personally, I didn't I didn't enjoy starting. I didn't enjoy coming to the park knowing that I wasn't going to play. That's the one thing I loved about being a reliever. And sometimes in the minor leagues, you see a guy and he has stuff – to get through a lineup one time, but he doesn't have stuff to get to, through a lineup multiple times. So that kind of pushes a guy into a reliever type role. But then there's some guys that they can do both. I mean, you look at a guy like, um, you know, they talk about the Braves pitchers all the time and, you know, how great Maddox was and all those other guys. But uh, John Smoltz to me was the best pitcher of all of them. You know, he, he won a ton of games as a starter and saved a lot of games as a reliever. He was, you know, multitasking guy. And you, you run across guys like that in the minor leagues, but, um, you know, it just depends on the guy's nature. Because not everybody can handle, like for me, I'm a, I'm, I was a setup man. So if I come in the job, come in the game and do my job, nobody knows me. Nobody really even realizes I pitch. But if I come in the game and I do poorly, all the reporters are going to come to my locker and I'm going to be on the ESPN usually giving up a home run or a game changing hit, you know? So, you know, a lot of people don't have the mentality to be able to deal with that. When the reporters would be coming to your locker after one of those types of games, how long would it take you to flush it and put it in the rearview mirror? Uh, usually after they left your locker, because, you know, they're going to, make you reminisce about that, that moment they're gonna bring it back up but um you know you can't you can't harp on it good or bad I mean you go out there and strike out the side and I mean you, you can face three four or five hitters of a team with the base loaded and mow them all down but it means absolutely nothing f for the next day so you you have to always put it behind you and do your best to stay in the moment you know and that's where you have to reside when you play at that level uh, speaking of bullpens, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you could put it on paper, that 97 Orioles bullpen, 98 wins, wire to wire, but on down, uh, the season Randy Myers had, uh, you, Arthur Rhodes, Jesse Orozco, uh, just up and down, and a really good starting staff as well, uh, which helps. Mm -hmm. Is that the best bullpen, one of the best bullpens ever? Um, you know, if we had a lead after six innings, the game was normally over. Um, you know, when, when you have guys of that, that talent, that ca caliber, you know, usually you take a lead with nine outs to go and it's pretty much a done deal. Cause you know, we had some guys that could do some things in that bullpen. It was, it was a lot of fun being on that team. I should mention Armando Benitez as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, part of that bullpen, but it's very deep bullpen. I mean, it wasn't just one guy. Right, right, right. Like I said, I mean, and you know, with Davey, Davey was it was it was weird, you know. He kind of used us in in groups, you know, and he always seemed to put us in the in a situation where we would be successful and not not be too too tired or overworked, where we were we were fresh most of the time. It worked out really well. When you had an opportunity to to save some games and see so you had fifteen saves in your career, did you did you enjoy it coming in and closing out games? Um. 
Yeah, I enjoyed it. I never, I never really got the opportunity to really close and lose games, you know, or lose the job. I mean, it was like um, the one opportunity, I think, when we had uh, Greg Olson and he uh, left the team and I had a chance to actually fall into that role of following year. I think that was the year we, we went and got Lee Smith and, you know, his, his, you know, stats speak for themselves. So I never really had an opportunity to do it. I, I'm, I'm not disappointed that I didn't, you know, the chances I had, you know, I enjoyed, um, I just enjoyed playing, you know, whether it was as a closer, set up man, starter, long reliever, just playing at that, that level you know, is a dream come true. So I never had a problem with whatever they wanted me to do. Going back to the playoffs of 96 and 97, uh, the atmosphere at Camden Yards. And uh, I know it's hard to go back and remember each game, but obviously 96, first playoff game ever at Camden Yards. I mentioned the Indians were in. And uh, Brady leads, hits a home run, I think, in the first inning. Bonilla hits a grand slam. Uh, and it was really an upset victory. And people, I mean, the 97 division series, I know you guys didn't think it was an upset. That Mariners team was stacked, and Mucina mm -hmm. had to beat Randy Johnson twice in, uh, in four games. But take us back just to the atmosphere at the ballpark, those, two, those uh, playoff series in 96 and 97. Um, I distinctly remember, you know, uh, the, the beginning of the 96 playoffs. Um, our bullpen was kind of – we were kind of loose. You know, there was nothing – it was nothing to see us running around, maybe even somebody – couple of guys out there wrestling you know it was um <laughs> we, we just had fun we enjoyed we enjoyed it and I remember the first game at Camden Yards nobody was saying anything nobody it was almost like the nervous energy and um I remember looking at the guys I go man do you guys feel that and they're like what and I said I'm nervous you know I'm, I'm really nervous I said but you know, there are a ton of teams at home wishing they were here feeling those nerves, you know, and we kind of loosened up and um, just went out and played. But, uh, you know, all those games, all those series, they were, they were special. And, um, you know, except for that little kid in New York, you know. <laughs> you know, hopefully, you know, or, you know, I wish things could have been a little different. I, I just kind of wish if – that ball wouldn't have touched his hands. I think things would have gone a little different those two years and maybe a few years after that. When that happened, what did you see and, and what were you all thinking in the bullpen? Um, you know, you could – you look at the replays now. I mean, you can see the guy reaching over the fence you, unless you're a blind man. I mean, everybody knew what he did. The umpires knew what he did. You know, they just didn't reverse the call. I, you know, I – I honestly believe if it was the other way around and we would have hit the ball and the guy would have done that, they would have reversed the call because they were the home team. You know, being the fact that they were the home team, you know, there are a lot of probably issues, them leaving the stadium safely, you know, just getting out of New York safely. So, I mean, there are a lot of different things. The things that I remember most about that was the next day was Garcia was down the right field line signing autographs which, you know, as a team we thought was terrible because we saw the replay on the ESPN all night. Everyone knew it was a bad call. He knew it was a bad call. He had to see it. And, you know, not to blame him for anything. I mean, everyone makes mistakes. But to add insult to injury, him signing autographs of the newspapers that came out the next day, you know, kind of left a bad taste in our mouths. Do, do, do you have a visual of uh, Armando Benitez running out to right field? And, I mean, just to see that picture, even looking back all these years later, it's, it's quite a picture to watch Armando in a dead sprint along with the manager of the team <laughs> towards an umpire in right field. Yeah, it was, it was chaos, man. I mean, we were, you know, like I said, we were hot. I mean, we were, we were pretty, pretty hot team at that time. And, um, you know, we were looking forward to going to World Series, and we didn't care who, you know, who we had to play. But, um, yeah, that 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 took a lot of air out of us. I mean, a whole lot. I mean, we, we played, but, you know, we win that game. What was that, the first game, second game? That was game one. First game. You, you know, you win that first game in New York. You, 
you get a chance to go up and, you know, the whole thing changes. I, I, I still believe to this day that that affected us for two years because the next year we came out, you know, we went wire to wire. And the only thing we were really thinking about was getting to um, get into the playoffs and playing the Yankees in the uh, ALCS. And they lost to Cleveland. We went to play Cleveland. It was almost like a letdown. Because, you know, we wanted to play the Yankees, and Cleveland came out and they played us. They, they outplayed us, you know. It was a great series between us. But it, for us, it was a letdown because we wanted to return the favor to New York, what happened the year before. So I think that, that one little play affected the team for two years. Mm. In the clubhouse after the game, what was Tony Tarasco saying? You know something, you could almost hear a pin drop. You know, Tony was pissed. We were all pissed. And it was, you know, when you get to that situation, you know it's not going to change. So you you do your best to try to put it behind you. But, you know, like, it's not like a regular series. It's not like, okay, I'm playing Kansas City and it's in July. You know, you're playing to go to World Series. That's the thing you dream about all your life as a kid. And, you know, now you're in that situation and you hate to see it get a game get dictated by something like that. But, you know, we tried our best to put it behind us and uh, we did. You know, it's not like we just folded after that. Uh, I think we won game two and um, we just we just lost. I mean, it was just an unfortunate incident, really unfortunate. You know, it's interesting to me, and unfortunately, I was 12 or 13 years old as a diehard fan in those days, so it's one of those things you carry with you your whole life, unfortunately. But one is the Jeter legacy of one that is an October megastar, which is true, but it starts, his first playoff home run is a, is a fly ball to right field, and, and that kind of starts this aura. That's, I mean, that's kind of interesting. Also, I've never understood the obsession of the Bartman play at Wrigley Field years later as the defining fan interference play. I mean, that was kind of in the stands. It was a foul ball, and right. it doesn't decide really anything in that moment. Yes, it let the air out of the balloon in Wrigley Field. It changed, you know, all the ghosts of, of Chicago. But, I mean, that's a, that's a home run in right field that, that cost game one of the American League Championship Series. Right, right. And, you know, you know, it's funny about both of those situations. The kid in New York, Jeffrey Meyer, or whatever his name yeah. is, he didn't even get the ball. You know, yeah, he, he touched it, but he didn't even get the ball. He didn't catch it. He just, you know, interfered with it. The same thing in Chicago, you know, when you look at those replays, the guy that they blamed, I don't think he even touched the ball. He just happened to stand up, and that's who, you know, the left fielder ran into. But, um, you know, both those both those situations were, were poor. But, like I said, the one was a home run or it was – Granted, a home run, but yeah. and the other one was a foul ball. So you go ahead a couple of years to Yankee Stadium, and uh, Armando Benitez drills <laughs> Tino Martinez in the back, Ooh. and uh, the bullpen's empty, and everyone comes out onto the field. Um, can you take us back through sort of what happened um, on that particular night between you and Daryl Strawberry? Um, I'm allergic to strawberries, so I don't know what you mean. <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take you through what I recall and what I remember of that game. Um, it, it was, it was funny in a way because I pitched right before Armando. So I was in the dugout. I came in the game to face, um, Jeter. And Jeter flew out to right, and they took me out. Bernie Williams was a switch hitter. So I think Davey wanted Amando to face him instead of me. So he, Amando comes in the game. I think Bernie ends up hitting a home run. And Tino comes up next, and they take the lead. And that's kind of how it was for us in 96. We just could not ever beat them. We were just as good as them. But there was always something that would happen that kind of gave them an edge at, at the end. So, you know, they took the lead. And I'm sitting in the dugout like, okay, what is it going to take for us to be able to, you know, finish these guys? And Benitez is still out there. He's pissed. I see it in his face. And I look, and Tino's coming up. 
And then a situation happened earlier in Benitez's career where he drilled Tino after a home run when Tino was playing for Seattle. So I'm looking at Tino come up, I look at Amondo, and I get deja vu. And it was like, oh, man, I remember when he drilled this guy, you know, when he was with Seattle. And they say, you know, there's a 99-mile-an-hour fastball right in the middle of his back. And it had to hurt. I mean, it, it had to hurt. And they say, you know, you know everything kind of gets kind of crazy. I'm relaxed. I'm not doing anything. Strawberry comes out of the dugout. He's pissed. They're pissed. They, as they should be. You know, because he hit him on purpose, as far as I know. That's what I think. I don't know for sure. But, um, yeah, he did. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, it kind of gets crazy, but nothing gets out of hand until Graham Lloyd and Jeff Nelson. I think Nelson is from Maryland. He is. Um, came out of the bullpen, and they were pissed, and they they're right, rightfully so. You know, he drilled a guy, and um, it kind of got chaotic. So now you got three guys trying to get at Armando. Never really happened, but it was chaotic. And then they kind of calmed down. Then Strawberry started back up. And then it kind of poured over into our dugout. And like I said, I was I was chilled. I was, you know, hell, I'd be mad too if they hit my teammate, you know. So we're in the dugout. Armando's to my right. And I'm on the step. I'm holding like this guy named Stanton. And Jeter and I have a common friend named Gerald Williams. You know, even though Jeter and I aren't good friends, we're friends through a friend. So he's screaming like, what's wrong with your boy? What's wrong with, what's wrong with Amanda? I was like, I was looking at him and I was actually smiling. It was so funny. I was smiling at the time. And I was like, okay, I don't have enough time to tell you what's wrong with Amondo. There are a lot of, he has a lot of issues, you know? And I was kind of smiling about it. And the next thing you know, I saw a shadow. And it was Strawberry taking a shot at Benitez. And he just kind of fell into our dugout. Not literally fell, but he stepped down into our dugout. And, you know, I just start walking toward him. And I hit him, you know, it wasn't like anything was planned. I just didn't think he belonged in our dugout. I mean, you have your own dugout. And it kind of got crazy after that. So, um, like I said, I'm allergic to strawberries. That's all I remember. What What was a bigger, more intense brawl, that one or the one in 93 against Seattle uh, when Mucina hit Hasselman? Um, both were intense. Um, both were very intense. Uh, for me, the one in New York, I don't want to say was more intense. It was just different. You know, once I, when I went down and I hit Strawberry, it kind of got crazy in the dugout. And, um, you know, it was, it was intense. The one in, in Baltimore with um, Mucina, like I was saying earlier in the call, Mucina had hit a groove where sometimes you're, you're in the bullpen and once he hits those groups, you're like, man, I'm not pitching today. You know, we might not get used. So we were kind of like in a, in a shutdown mode in the bullpen. And when he hit the guy, I was actually by the bathroom. And it was, it was weird because we had always talked about, in Camden Yards, I don't think until that point there had ever been a brawl. In a brawl situation, what are we going to do? We're going to go down the steps and open the gate and go, you know, how, how is this going to, you know, take place? So when I heard the crowd, I looked to the outfield to see who, where the guys were running. Because usually when you hear that sound, it's a ball going toward the fence. And I saw all the guys going toward the fence and they were jumping it. So I was the last guy out of the bullpen and I didn't want to be the last guy. So I called everybody and me and Norm Charlton got into a little thing. Me and um, Buner got into a little thing. It was, it was intense. The thing I remember about that brawl is after the game, there were policemen lying through the tunnels all the way to the buses, which was kind of weird. You know, it's like, okay, well, 
you know, it's over as far as I was concerned. Yeah, I thought it was it was kind of weird. It was, it was almost like they had a SWAT team underneath the stadium. But th- those those things are never fun. They're dangerous, actually. They're really – you got a bunch of grown men out there. You never know what's going to happen. Over time, how have the, the, the unwritten rules changed when it comes to pitchers protecting teammates who, who got hit by the other team? Um, I think the guys now, as opposed to back when I played, um, they're, they're a little more friendly. You know, like one of the first things they told me when I came into the league, like, look, don't talk to the opposing team hitters. You know, if you have a friend on the other team, you know, take them out to lunch, take them out to breakfast, take them out to dinner after the game. But during the game, you know, before and after whatever, or before the game on the field, don't talk to them. Now, you know, you see guys when they do their pregame runs, they they stop behind second base, hug, you know, and talk all the time. It's just a con- completely different um, atmosphere. I think, you know, the guys now, they make so much money that even, you know, if you you watch a game, guys don't – they don't throw inside like, like we used to. You know, they, they kind of keep the ball away. And I don't know if it's like, okay, I don't want to maybe end somebody's career and, you know, hit them by mistake. But, you know, the, the game's played a lot different now than it, it was before. And I, I, I don't know what the reason that is, but they, they just don't – they don't play the same way. Alex, you mm-hmm. always kind of represent this, this old school way. When it comes to those unwritten rules that everyone talks about, does someone literally take a rookie or a second year player and say, here's how it works? Or do you learn by kind of osmosis and observing and here's what you're supposed to do in those spots, whether it's protecting one of your guys or making someone's not crowding the plate or uh, here's how we deal with opponents. I mean, how does that actually work? Um, it's by osmosis is more than anything. Um, I remember when I was a, a rookie with the Yankees, um, we were playing Seattle and Ken Griffey, you know, Ken Griffey's Ken Griffey. He was killing us. And one of the infielders came up and said, Hey, look, the guy at second base is signaling to, um, to the home plate, you know, King Griffey drilling. And I was looking at the guy at second base, you know, before he even came, you know, to the to the mound to tell me that. And I never hit the guy. They got mad at me because I didn't hit him. But I just think they wanted me to hit him because he was he was killing us. But I was like, okay, maybe we should make better pitches. I'm not gonna hit him just you know, just for that reason. But, you know, you make up your own mind when it comes to a lot of stuff. I remember an incident happened with uh, Mike Givens in in Bowie when I was his pitching coach. And um, I think we were playing the Nationals and the guy hit a home run, took down a few trees in right field. Um, Just a massive, massive home run. And Givens drilled the next guy. And I remember the, the manager, Gary Kendall, looking at me like, okay, did you tell him to do that? And I'm like, I'm standing here next to you. I mean, how, how could I tell him? So it's, for a pitcher, it all depends on how you feel. Sometimes, just like Amanda, when he hit Tino, he felt like hitting him. And I've thrown at guys. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and lie and try to pretend like I'm some kind of saint. I've thrown at guys. I've hit guys on purpose. I've, I've thrown balls near guys not to hit them, you know, just to kind of, kind of scare them a little bit. But the game – the game's completely changed now. I mean, they they just do it a different way. And I'm not saying the way we did it was right and the way they do it is wrong. It's just a different way they play the game. You talked about your time as a pitching coach, and you've also uh, spent last year as a manager uh, with the, the GCL Orioles. When, when you got out of playing, did you always know that, that coaching or managing was something that you wanted to do? I never wanted to coach. I never even thought about it. I, I never thought I would like it. Um, you know, just so happened, you know, when I, when I did get out of the game, I ended up going through a divorce. So the reason that um, some of the things I was looking forward to doing when I retired, you know, weren't there anymore. So um, I only started coaching. 
I ran into a college classmate and he was coaching a JV team and I went out and helped him out and, and just loved it. So I, I never really thought about coaching until that moment. You were talking earlier about a pitcher's relationship with a manager is different than a position player. I know you're kind of bred not to like hitters, but now you're a manager of the mm -hmm. GCL team. What's that like for you to, to relate to everyday position players? You know, it was, it was, it was, um, it was a learning experience for me. Um, being a pitcher, pitcher and being a pitching coach for a number of years, going to the other side, you know, for me, it was like, okay, is this what they do all day? Because all they do is hit. You know, that's all they want to do. They, they don't want to do anything else. All they want to do is hit. So spending so much time in the cage and watching their daily routine, because usually, you know, you're with the pitchers. So, you know, it was, it was different for me, but it was, it was a good change. I enjoyed the change. Uh, I think it was needed you know, at that particular time in, in my life. But um, I enjoyed it, man. I really I really had a really good time, had a great staff. Uh, the young guys were, you know, energetic. They, were, they, they really loved playing, and they played really well. Who were a few people that maybe you asked for for advice about, about managing? Was Gary one of them that, that, that maybe you, you leaned on trying to get some advice about? About how to be a good manager when you hadn't done it before. Did you have, did you say Gary? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I just try to take what I what I learned from all the guys I've been with. You know, managers, um, coaches. Um, you know, I I really like playing for David Johnson. I like playing for Johnny Oates. Um, I I enjoyed you know the things I learned from them. Um, the guys I've been with in the minor leagues that were managers, uh, Gary Kendall. Uh, Gary Allenson, um, Ryan Miner, you know, a lot of a lot of different things from different people. And I just tried to pull the things I liked that, that I saw them do and the things that I like and just tried to incorporate it and make it a make it an environment where it was a, a learning environment also and incorporate it with, with fun where you can enjoy it. You know, I, I think sometimes we lose sight in the baseball profession, you know, at, at the minor league level, also at the major league level, um, that, is, that it is a game and you have to enjoy it. You know, like if I could go back and do anything different, you know, I would probably enjoy it more when I was playing. You know, it's like try to emphasize to a lot of big league players, you know, you, you spend your entire childhood, you know, following this dream and then once you get here, you have to take time to enjoy it because you're competing at the highest level every day. And this is a dream. This is what you want to do. So, you know, it doesn't get any better than this. It's no higher league. So you should enjoy it. You know, you should enjoy it while you're there because it, it passes by. I don't care how long you play. It passes by really fast. You obviously coached under him, but you I'm guessing you knew a young Buck Showalter working your way up through the New York system, correct? I um, you know, I knew him my, my first full year was with the with the Yankees. So I've known I've known Buck since nineteen eighty seven. How has he changed, if at all? Um well, I mean he's older in nineteen eighty seven. Uh, we we both are, but I mean he he was always a, a successful manager. Uh, always kind of pay particular attention to detail, you know, and that that's what I learned from, you know, just watching him and how he went about his business. Uh, his first year as a coach in the big leagues was 1990, which was my rookie year. So we actually lived in the same apartment building, but, um, you know, he just, a lot of stuff that I learned watching him, I incorporated as a manager last year, you know, just, you know, how to, how to prepare a team and how to, like you said, pay attention to detail and just do the best you can to prepare the team for the game, you know, and kind of go from there. It'll probably go down as a, a trivia question at some point, but uh, you were the first manager that, that Adley Rutschman um, had when um, he got to the GCL, when, when he arrived and started getting into his routine and, and playing games of uh, what were some things that, that stood out about him right away? Uh, Adley? 
Mm-hmm. Um, if he stayed there much longer, he was going to get somebody hurt. <laughs> that's what that's, that's what stood out to me. Um, you know, he's a talented individual. He can really hit. Um, I noticed that. You know, from the first first game he played, I think he hit a hit a line drive to the shortstop, and the ball passed the pitcher so fast. Um, you, you couldn't tell if it almost hit the pitcher or not. I mean, he hit another – he hit a home run that day, and, you know, I kind of teased him. I go, man, you're going to get some people released if you stay here too long. You need to, you know, move to a different level. But, um, you know, the way the way the ball comes off his bat is, um, is special. And, um, you know, hopefully he can keep making progress and end up in Camden Yards. That'd be great. And we'll end on this. If you – had to or really wanted to, could you grow back that famous mustache that you had on the mound at Camden Yards for about a decade right now? I, I grow it. I grow it and, you know, I shave it. I'm not a person that stands in the mirror too often. You know, I don't want to scare myself. But um, I'll grow it every now and then. Like, it, it comes during the season at different points. You know, it's more more for me a feel. You know, it's kind of hard to have that kind of mustache and you're in social distance. And, you know, with that mustache, people kind of stay away from me anyway. So that's the last thing I need right now. But, um, you know, it, it comes and goes. It, it has its moments. Right now it's not a moment. All right. Alan Mills, great catching up. The former Oriole, uh, someone uh, who's still in the system coaching, the manager of the GCL Orioles, uh, number 75 in the pride of Kathleen High School in Lakeland. Alan, thank you so much. That was fun. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. The bird is at home just like you and misses seeing Orioles fans. But you can request the bird to make a surprise virtual appearance for your next birthday party or gathering. For more information about a virtual appearance, visit Orioles.com slash bird. And my birthday is coming up in June, and I think I might make a request for that. I'm a June birthday as well, Jeff. What's your date? 29th. You? 20th. Okay. Oh, we all need a little more bird in our lives. I think yes, we can we all do. say that right now. We, however it comes, we all need a little more bird in our lives. Uh, that, that's a lot of fun. Uh, Alan Mills, what's your big takeaway, Jeff? Uh, my big ta- I had so many, but I'd say that the, the thing that stood out the most was when he talked about Jeffrey Mayer and yeah. him reaching over and how it, it not only set the tone for the rest of that series, it set the tone for the next two years. I thought that was really telling that one moment, and even though they won game two, the, the way he said that moment just kind of wrecked us. And you, you, he, he pointed out, too, that it, it probably would have been the opposite if the Orioles had hit. Because he's like, you couldn't have not seen Jeffrey Mayer reach over the fence. And it, it might have been just the umpires didn't want to have to battle the fans. It could have, it could have been any number of things. But, but his take, too, on how – if that was an Orioles player who had hit that ball, that call gets changed. It's fan interference. But I did find it funny how he said that, you know, Jeffrey Murray, even though he reached over the fence, he didn't actually come, come up with a baseball. Listen, <laughs> we're talking about something that took place in 1996. It's 2020 right now. Uh, we both interviewed a lot of professional athletes in our lives, a lot of former athletes. I've done it throughout, you know, a couple of different sports. And Alan Mills actually – had some of the best recall of anybody. I mean, he really did, if you think about it. Um, and he put us right in that moment with Jeffrey Mayer. Now, clearly, Alan, you can tell us someone who's gone back, maybe looked at it a few times, agonized over it in the YouTube era as it's kind of reemerged as something. Uh, but it is interesting. I made two points. I mean, one, even to this day, I heard Dan Schulman talk about the Barman incident. And, and listen, that is something that if you're a Cubs fan, I get it. You're up in that series. It's Wrigley Field. We get the history. But that is a foul ball down the line. It decided nothing in the sense of, of that moment. And it was borderline, I thought. I mean, really, if you look at it, maybe Bartman reached out a little bit or a couple of guys did, what have you. This is one, it's incredibly clear, clear cut. I mean, that is, that's an out. Uh, and the result of the play is a home run. And then it not only takes the air out of the balloon for the Orioles, but it it's runs on the board in a key moment late in the game in Yankee Stadium. You're already a dog in that series. So, to me, they're both league championship series. It's just the obsession probably because it's Chicago. But that's Yankees-Orioles in, in the middle 90s. And that game was on NBC uh, with Bob Costas. And, I mean, God, I mean, the amount of millions and millions of viewers that game had 
It's just surprising to me the Bartman plan comparison. It, it did come of age in more of an internet period of time, so maybe that's why it's lived so well. And ESPN did the 30 for 30 on it. But, Jeff, we should put together the Jeffrey Mayer 30 for 30 on that because I just think that that would have legs. I mean, Mayer, who's kind of reemerged himself, all we need is Tarasco, Richie Garcia, and, and Armando. We could have a party. <laughs> well, I, don't know how, I don't know how pleasant of a party that would be, but I, I agree with you. To me, it's, it's number one, when it took place and the, the era in which it took place. It also had to do with the, the Cubs' long Billy Goat deal right. where they had gone years and years without winning a World Series. But, yeah, to me, if you're, you're talking about impactful plays in the playoffs – don't forget that the Bartman deal was a foul ball, the ball that Jeter hit that kind of, you know, in a way started Jeter's legacy and, and kind of got him on the map. And, you know, him as a so-called, you know, a wonder boy in, you know, when you look at it, the ball left the ballpark, ended up tying the game. And then Randy Myers gives up the home run in extra innings. Yeah. And, you know, that kind of cemented what was the, uh, what was the series between the Yankees and the Orioles, 96. And just the aura of Jeter himself. I mean, think about that for a moment. I mean, his legacy is that of someone with, you know, obviously let's not kid ourselves here, a consummate regular season performer. But his legacy is his October performances and, and the rings, right? I mean, that's, that's Jeter. So it's built in large part his rookie season, his first league championship series, the first game – and he hits a late inning home run that was, in actuality, a fly ball to right field. Now, does he still become someone who had big moments in October and actually November as well? Probably, probably. But as we watch the uh, last dance and the Jordan stuff, those early moments, as far as confidence goes, probably go a long way. They go a long way. And, and consider this, too. If it sort of started with that moment, the home run in game one of the ALCS in 96 – and then you go back to the last regular season game he played at Yankee Stadium where he comes up with the walk-off hit. Who does it come against? The Orioles. There's some symmetry there. There's no question about it. And, you know, listen, I, there's still nights I wake up uh, with bad dreams about Jeter finding a way to, like, you know, get a run in from second base and, you know, finding some hole in the right side. I mean, he tormented the Orioles for a, a couple of decades. So, yeah, he tormented a lot of teams, to be fair. It wasn't like he was just picking on the Orioles. But um, even when we look back at that 2012 division series, he had a great year in 12. I mean, he was at the end. That was his last great se uh, season. But, uh, yeah, that, he's the thorn. I mean, he's the thorn for a lot of Orioles fans uh, growing up in that era. But uh, we reminisce. Hopefully there's some forgiveness there as well. Uh, but it was fun going back with Alan Mills. Uh, just an intense guy, but a really fun, interesting, uh, smart guy. Uh, to talk baseball with. So that was a lot of fun, uh, Jeff, today. And we got some more great stuff coming up. So continue to check us out, spread the word, tweet about it, spread it on social. And Jeff, we will talk soon, my friend. Yes, indeed, Brett. Be safe and uh, in, enjoy uh, these next couple of days until we reunite. Have a great one, everyone. So long. <laughs>